Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy that you could be here for uh, a public display of what we've done for an edited collection for the ETE Open Book series. Uh, Julia and I co-edited a book on Habits of Mind, Designing Courses for Student Success. If you are wondering when it's going to be available, probably by the end of next week. I am still going through the copy editing stages and getting everything up online. Uh, but I do have at least one big announcement, which is there is a Habits of Mind Institute that has been operating for many years. And we got on their radar with this. And uh, they will be posting this book on their website. So if you're thinking about the reach that your chapter had, there's many authors here, but then also the reach of USU and what we're doing for infusing study skills with content, that reach is going to be bigger uh, because of that. And they can just do that because our open access uh, book and the Creative Commons allows them to just post it on their website anyways. Uh, so we would have no, no choice to say no to them, uh, but uh, we've been uh, doing outreach with them and making sure that the impact and all the wonderful things that you're doing are going to be known to even more people. So I think that's very exciting. Before we get into that, um, we are gonna just give a little bit of an overview um, of the Habit of Mind framework and what's really important to know is that there's a million different educational frameworks, right? Julia and I were drawn to this one because of its flexibility across disciplines and hopefully creating a collection that is university-wide. And so habits of mind, there have been different uh, models that have made this up to 32 different habits. We decided on the most recent one that the Habits of Mind Institute has done that boils down uh, certain study skills and academic dispositions to 16 general categories. And we thought these were flexible enough to ultimately cover a bunch of things that instructors at USU were doing maybe just naturally, but then also very intentionally. And so if you're thinking about your intentional practice, I would recommend that you go and you look at these 16 different things. A lot of them are in uh, kind of teaching best practices generally, like metacognition and helping your students think about their thinking. But then things like persevering is also there, which I like that much better than grit. <laughs> uh, grit sounds like kind of like suck it up and deal with this shit to me. Uh, <laughs> I'm from New England. Oh, we're recording too. I shouldn't swear. <laughs> uh, I am from New England. I am rough around the edges still. Um, but this is a good way to think about intentionality of your teaching, but then also uh, kind of a good just boiled down model for this. All right. We've got to transfer these microphones so the recording picks us up. It should come from the Habits of Mind Institute. Perhaps they have updated it in the past three days. <laughs> oh, okay. No worries. Great. <laughs> I'm so excited for you, Kim. <laughs> All right, so we have 22 chapters in this book that Chris said will be available likely by the end of next week. It's 115,000 words because of the contributions of our authors who are all amazing. And it represents 32 really dynamic USU instructors who have embedded their teaching philosophies, their course design, their assessments with these wonderful study skills. So thinking about how to best organize this, Chris and I divided it into four sections that really are thematic. So we have starting, which primarily focus on our gateway courses. So usually our 1,000 level, our introductory courses of how can we start to develop those habits of mind early on. We then moved on to reflecting. A lot of our instructors are doing really great work with reflecting in learning. What are you thinking about? Um, you know, how are you really thinking about that metacognition, especially in our mid to upper division courses? That seems to be where this really lies. Then we're moving on to growing, which also focuses on metacognition and growth mindset. That idea of grit, perhaps, or <laughs> persisting and perseverance 
Also, points of academic belonging is in there as well. How can we foster this sense of belonging within the higher education classroom? And then we decided on page four as mooring, which is a nautical term. Since you were from New England, you were much more familiar with nautical terms than I was. But this is about also applying these skills to difficult situations or situations outside of the traditional classroom. So thinking about how are you going to take these skills from your college classroom, from your college career, into your life as a 21st century global educated citizen. How can we teach them that? So we're really excited to share this with you. Today we have invited seven of our wonderful authors to come talk just a little bit, to whet your appetite, to read this. Um, we also have a podcast that will be going along with this book that will also be released next week, so just FYI. But each individual author or team of authors is going to talk just very briefly about the habits of mind that they've done, about their chapter, and then we're just gonna have a brief conversation. This is meant to be very informal, just to get you into these ideas of habits of mind and essentially to read the book. If we run out of time, I do wanna say at 4.30, so literally immediately following this, we are going to quickly walk over to TSC 221, where we are having a reception for all of the authors and any community members who want to come and celebrate the achievements of our authors with some snacks and I think Aggie Sparkle will be there, so those sorts of things. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna actually move through the book. So we are starting with Dr. Jennifer Drewy, who's chapter two, preparing students with habits of mind for the first day of class. Perfect. So if you all know me, and I, I know a lot of people in the room, um, this makes perfect sense why I'm talking about this topic. Uh, so. I took an approach with the Habits of Mind um, chapter, talking about some of the, uh, the Habits of Mind that are really important for before school even starts, before that they can start to gather and learn um, before they have that first day of class. And I did that through, so I, I am the director of a program on campus that we have that's a first year experience program called Connections. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a frog in my throat. Um, and this program, we do really um, focus on a lot of these elements of habits of mind. We're really intentional in our curriculum. And so in the chapter, I go into some detail on that. Um, I just, just briefly, uh, so they talked about persisting. Um, so as I started looking at that and looking at what we do to help students persist, I gave some different examples in the chapter, but I also introduced the concept of academic buoyancy because that really reflected, I, I use res resiliency too in many contexts, but the um, buoyancy term and idea of being able to bounce back from those smaller stumbles. Uh, so things like they miss an assignment, they miss a due date, and that they can keep persisting despite those little setbacks. Um, that's, that's a lot of times, those little setbacks added up are where I see students quit. They just stop participating. Um, we know with our first year experience course connections, we've got data that shows that students that get a C or worse um, actually are, are, are in big trouble of not being retained at the university. And so, um, we talk about how we uh, intentionally put in these uh, habits of mind. Some of the things I go into detail in the chapter is some of the metacognitive skills. I also, you know, we use these fancy terms, but I, as I start to peel it apart, I think, these are life skills. I mean, th some of these things like are, you know, we start to use a framework and uh, do an assignment talking about time management and having them go through that process. Um, and an assignment on res resiliency, but this, it's so transferable, it can transfer. And as a teacher of a first year survey large class, I have 250 students in my class, um, that, those skills, I carry those on in that first year, and they're really critical and important. Okay, that was brief, but is that okay? Yeah, I can keep right. going. <laughs> I can go 45, 50 chat. minutes or an hour and 15. <laughs> so anyway, I want to make sure everybody has time. Okay. Next up we have Cree Taylor, who's chapter three, improving the general education experience through equitable and inclusive pedagogical practices. I should, you can tell I'm in, from the English department because that title. Why did I do that? <laughs> I was so tired. Okay, 
So I wrote my notes down because I am from the English department and I teach writing. So that's what happened. I had to model what I tell my students to do. Make a one pager for your presentations. So I had to do that. Um, so in the English department, I teach primarily English 1010 and English 2010. Um, in English 1010, students learn, this is from the catalog, and I know my uh, director of composition loves the catalog descriptions of our classes. Uh, it says, English 1010, students learn skills and strategies for becoming successful academic readers, writers, and speakers, how to read and write critically, generate and develop ideas, work through multiple drafts, collaborate with peers, and present ideas orally. For 20, most students take 1010 in high school, by the way. And then for 20, in 2010, um, focuses on the writing of reasoned academic arguments supported with appropriately documented sources, focuses on library and internet research, evaluating and citing sources, oral presentations based on research and collaboration. I just need to point out that the grammar was not included in there. So if you're worried about grammar, that's not our fault. Um, I also teach um, a gen ed course called English 2640, which is a race, race and ethnicity in the United States course. It's a placeholder course until we get an ethnic studies department here on campus, which you don't have. But my chapter focused um, on my composition courses. So um, I just pulled a couple of uh, paragraphs from the chapter and then summarized what I talk about. Um, but one of the things I write in here, I just say one unfortunate reality of general education courses is that they are notorious among university students. They hate them. They don't want to take them. and They don't understand why they have to. Um, students often see these courses as a barrier to overcome, a waste of time and a waste of, tu and a waste of tuition. In my opinion, it's not very biased, it's not like I teach them. In my opinion, student dislike of general education courses is fueled by two factors. Number one, students' misunderstanding of the purpose of general ed. And number two, general education instructors design courses with a gatekeeping mentality. So traditionally, general education courses have served as gatekeepers of the university experience, either intentionally or unintentionally. I would argue more often it's unintentional these days. Um, but they try to funnel students out who don't belong through poor course design. Racially minoritized students, women, first generation college students are disproportionately affected by this gatekeeping mentality. Um, and first year composition courses like I teach are not an exception. I mean, they were literally designed because people, they were like, oh, land grant, oh, farmers, they can't write. Let's give them a class. Let's call it composition. Here we go, right? Women, they're coming. Oh, they can't write. Let's give them a class. Composition, here you go. So that's how the field even started. Um, and I have to, and so my position, my writing composition, um, that's how it started. And so we have to use that foundation, and it's moving, and the chapter will elaborate on that. Um, so in my chapter, when they said, when uh, the proposal came out, um, when it, the call for proposals came out, and they said, habits in mind, I immediately went to our framework that we have, um, writing program administrators, the three C's, Council on Composition something, and the National Council for Teachers of English developed a habits of mind framework for post-secondary writers. So that's where my brain went. So my chapter talks about four of the, those habits of mind that they have in that framework that intersect just, it's, they're all their habits, right? So the four that I talk about are openness, engagement, persistence, and responsibility. So with openness, I talk about using course readings to help students develop openness, openness, um, teach students about rhetorical listening, and expose students to readings that confront contra contra controversial topics head on. Um, with engagement, I talk about creating opportunities for students to become involved and invested in their own learning, learning rather than performing learning for the sake of a grade. Um, we talked about persistence already here today, but I talk about incorporating grading practices that encourage students to persist. Help students persist through trying, failing, receiving feedback, and trying again until they master a skill or objective in an environment conducive to learning. Um, I had a student who wrote a paper and they didn't read my syllabus, and this is how I knew they didn't read it, because they didn't do well on it. Um, I do a zero to four scale. I think they got a two or something, which it, they, it means they didn't get the outcome. They didn't get the objective. And then at the end of the semester, they're like, I really wish you'd let us revise our papers because I did really bad on my first one. And then I was like, why am I even trying anymore? I was like, you can't. Okay, like it says you can revise. But that was like a one, it says it, please revise, and I begged you to revise, but you missed it. But just that one, that element of, persist, or of persistence, how can I make it so my students want to keep trying? And what about my grading practices keeping them from trying? Um, and then the last one was responsibility. Provide students with a choice to help them feel ownership of their learning and education. Um, in general education, student choice might need to be more structured and scaffolded than in some of our upper division courses, um, but I talk about some of that scaffolding. So. Um, I think about habits of mind, they help cultivate an atmosphere of success in general education courses, which 
when she said values in the keynote, I was like, I value success, man. Success. Whatever that looks like for you, that's, and that maybe sounds bad, but I was raised in a capitalist society. Um, <laughs> So if we're trying to help students feel successful, we can set high expectations that align with course outcomes, and then we help them experience those successes through the policies, the structures, and the practices. Um, and so that's a little teaser for my chapter. You'll get more of my rambling in there also. Thank you, Yeah. Awesome. All right. Next up, we have chapter five from Missy, is it COVID? Go ahead. Structure for success, incorporating habits of mind into online courses. Thank you for bringing your notes up because I'm going to do the same. <laughs> so um, my, or my chapter was centered really on looking at ways to incorporate habits of mind into online courses. And I drew primarily from a large enrollment asynchronous introductory level online course I teach chemistry 1010 um, kind of keeping in mind that a lot of my students are coming into that class without necessarily having developed these habits of mind um, so a lot of my chapter includes um, just techniques that you can integrate into your canvas course um, things to consider with respect to um, trying to uncover some of the hidden curriculum with respect to unspoken rules and unwritten expectations about how to approach a college course. Um, and then a lot of other um, practices you can include to um, help students with persistence and encouraging them to take responsible risks and to, to think about their thinking. Um, I actually, I didn't, I just, I kept it really brief. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. I think one of the, I, I want to talk about your chapter just for a minute because I think there's so much of your chapter that is, all of these can be, you know, they're area specific, but they can be really transferred to a lot of different chapters. If you teach an online course, I have to say, please read Missy's chapter because she talks so much about the hidden curriculum, especially of online asynchronous education, and how you've really made efforts to try to teach students not just chemistry 101, but how to take online classes. And you provide examples that I think lots of people could crib, right, and put into your online class as well. So that's just my little additional plug. Thanks for helping us. Yes. <laughs> All right. We are skipping ahead to, this is now in our reflection section, chapter 14, with Professor Aisha Sopsi. Oh, perfect. Oh, wonderful. And, <laughs> and is it Auntie or Auntia? Auntia. Uh, growl. So, all right. Sure. Oh, so we have, I'm actually a loud person. You probably don't need this, but let's try. The recording needs it. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> so we had three minutes uh, for two people, so I'm going to try to finish mine in one and a half minutes. So our chapter is great, read it, done. <laughs> but um, so basically what we are trying to do in this chapter is we are trying to highlight the importance of application for courses that are more... Um, theory-based, more abstract. Um, application is going to help students love the course, but also it's going to help them develop some habits of mind, such as like thinking independently or thinking flexibly or using the past information to, uh, you know, um, to solve some issues that, that's arising. Um, Actually, when I was looking at the chart that you showed, we picked only three habits of minds that you know the application is really uh, doing. But honestly, it's pretty much doing all of those, like touching all those habits of minds. So to that extent, both Auntie and I introduced one assignment in our courses. I'm one of those people, unfortunately, who are teaching these upper level, very technical, very theoretical courses. Um, and students cannot quite relate with them. And so one assignment I introduced to this extent was, I call it news reports, uh, news reports analysis. And so what students do is they actually pick one news associated with uh, current economic news, and they use the material th that they are learning in the class to figure out what's going on, and they write a nice uh, report about it. Um, what happened is that, let me just, cut it short and tell you like one thing about this. 
Before I introduced the assignment, only about 15% of the students in their student evalu evaluations were mentioning that the application of the course is like a strength. But after the um, introduction of the assignment, 65% of the students were actually saying that application is the best part about this course. So, so and Auntie did something similar too, so she's gonna go over that. But let's exchange the mics. Thank you. Um, perfect. So just to add to this, um, it's really important for us, um, as she was saying, to give students the opportunity to learn from their mistakes. So before they go out into the real world and into the workspace, um, we really want them to provide, um, we want to provide them an opportunity to make mistakes in a safe environment and to learn from them and to improve. Um, and so we want them to make mistakes carefully and slowly and then improve and basically develop this mindset of growth right and to carry that on into their future careers and so um, I did something similar um, in my class where I do also teach a lot of theoretical concepts um, so for example theoretical concepts in terms of stakeholder management um, and then I do use um, case studies um, to allow students um, to put themselves into the position of the decision maker and so basically be in the shoes of a manager or a decision maker or a stakeholder manager um, and really come up with thinking flexibly and and um, may, maybe even innovatively, right? Um, and suggest strategies um, in that safe environment of the classroom of this case study. Um, but um, with the hope that by doing so, and our, actually our evaluations show that this is the case, that students really enjoy that and they really do enjoy learning those skills of growing and, and applying things to practice and then hopefully carrying that into their future workspace. Um, and so we, um, as we were writing our chapter, we found a lot of, um, evidence from the real world as well, where managers and especially hiring um, managers also were really looking for students um, with potential skill sets like that. So they are kind of like coming from a university, coming from a more theoretical mindset, but having the opportunity and the practice to apply what they know um, to practical scenarios and, and case studies. And so that really um, increased their employability. The students really loved working on those cases. Um, and so we just outlined some of those takeaways um, so if you are teaching a class that incorporates theoretical concepts or is very theory uh, driven, this might be a really nice chapter for you to read to maybe get some um, inspiration um, and see what students actually think about having the opportunity to apply theory to practice within a safe environment before they're actually the real decision maker and make those mistakes in the future. So um, yeah, if you want to read it, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Leave it to two marketing professors to say, read my book. Oh, economics, I'm sorry, sorry, that's right. <laughs> All right, I was wrong, you aren't last, you're second to last. But we have Kat uh, Ekaterina Arsh Arshavskaya, okay, um, who's doing chapter 20, service learning and community engaged projects for international and domestic students. This is a great example of that fourth section mooring. Okay, uh, yeah, so in my chapter, I talk about a service project and uh, community engaged teaching. So if this, is, if this is something you are interested in, that can be <laughs> a good chapter for you. And I work with uh, mostly international students, immigrant students, refugee students for whom English is an additional language, similar like to me. And another area of my work is language teachers. So I use my knowledge with, uh, of working with language students to teach uh, teachers. Um, and then I give several examples of service projects. And if we have still time, I maybe I can, yeah, we have. Yeah, so one of the examples is I, I take my language students to an art museum here on campus, and they interpret art uh, based on their cultural backgrounds. So we know in art, there's not like one right answer, right, especially with more than art. And so it's interesting to see that you can see at the same artwork and you see different things based on your personal education educational, cultural, and all kinds of backgrounds. And then after they do that, uh, we also invite a general audience, the public, uh, and my students give presentations at the museum, so that would be a non-traditional classroom space, uh, to the public, right? And my goals for that uh, would be 
they also aligned uh, with habits of mind, uh, uh, skills for intercultural communication, right? Uh, gathering data with different senses, right? At the museum, there is vi visuality, right? Visual, there is tactile, right? Sometimes you can interact physically, right? With the art, uh, art objects of art, art objects, <laughs> sorry. And then, um, yeah, and then I also asked my students what did they gain from this project, and it was interesting that all my goals that I listed for them, uh, which also aligned with habits of mind, uh, they were also in their feedback. So I could see that they really learned a lot from that project. And then um, I use those, I give several examples, I use those projects with my language teachers, so to encourage them kind of to do similar things. And then, um, um, another, just the last thing I want to mention, again, is the connection course. And I started very intuitively with habits of mind. So I have my language students, and I thought it's very limited. I don't just want to teach them the language. I feel like, especially international students or immigrant students, they also need the life skills, the study skills. They want to know the culture here, right? So they need all those survival skills and academic skills. And then when I um, got the training at Connections, and Jen is here if you want to know more, <laughs> yes, it really gave me the framework, uh, like how to do it in the classroom, and the theoretical framework, but also the assignments. They do a great job with this, uh, practical assignments on habits of mind. Um, yeah, I guess I'm done. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Right, and finally, we have Rachel Turner, who is Chapter 21, Developing Classroom Management Skills, Leveraging Habits of Mind in Pre-Service Teacher Education. Got to get back in the swing of this. I'm not used to having all the things on. <laughs> Being on Zoom the past couple of years. Um, all right, so hi, my name is Rachel, and I um, am in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership, and I teach pre service teachers that are going to be elementary teachers. Um, and so, just a little bit of context this is a class that all elementary, future elementary teachers take, and it's usually one of the biggest topics that they are most concerned about, they're most stressed about when they enter into the classroom. Um, and so last year, I spent some time reworking the course to have a um, culturally relevant pedagogy background or a, a lens to look through. And so at the beginning of the course, we talk about culturally relevant pedagogy, what that means. And then as we discuss all the different topics throughout classroom management, like procedures and classroom rules and dealing with parents, um, we use that as kind of a lens to look at. And so the way that I've structured my article is um, looking at the habits of mind and culturally relevant pedagogy and how they play together, and then looking at um, things like listening with understanding and empathy, thinking flexibly, managing impulsivity, um, and communicating in clarity with clarity and precision. Um, and what's interesting about this is that it's kind of an inception um, lens, I guess you could say, is because I'm modeling this for my pre-service teachers. They're practicing it within their class, and then they're also thinking about how they can use that in their classroom. Um, so it's kind of a multi-level of how these uh, habits of mind can be used and how they can use them in their own teaching as well. So thank you. <laughs> I never know how to end. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thanks. Well, I think that you have heard some really great previews, wet your whistle, right, from this that's, that's happening there, that we hope that you will be able to read more of this. Um, an easy way to access the book once it is ready, it's just habitsofmindbook.usu.edu. Really nice uh, vanity URL that Travis came up with for us. That is there. But I think what, what all of these chapters really demonstrate is there is so many people doing intentional work here with thinking about study skills, about you use the term life skills, and I heard others use that as well. But that's really what these are. How can you embed this at every level of the curriculum? I think we often imagine as higher education instructors, those are things students did in K through 12. That's done. I think we've seen through pandemic learning, some of the disruptions that happened there, also just from the change and the type of learning that's happening in high school classrooms. They're not always arriving as prepared as we think that they should be. Therefore, it is up to us to do some of that work to prepare them, not only for their college careers, but for their careers as 21st century global citizens as well. So I'm gonna encourage you to come to our 
uh, reception that is over in TSC 221 to ask any of our authors, anybody who has the little author on here is one of our authors, so feel free to talk to them. Oh, you don't, that's, that's awkward. Okay, I'll get you one. Okay, yeah, so you can talk to them about that. <laughs> But we invite you to come have snacks and celebrate with us. So thank you so much. Congratulations to our authors. And we will be in contact soon with the publication details.